Hello, Agnes. Hi, Robin. Today we have a special guest. That is me. <laughs> and who are you? Uh, I'm William Elliot. I'm, uh, I've been helping Robin and Agnes with the podcast since the start. Um, we've been slowly improving sound quality and uh, helping with the distribution as well. And we are very grateful, so grateful that you are visiting with us and we have decided to let you choose the topic of this podcast. Yeah, very generously you've invited me out and uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's exciting to be in, in Washington, D.C., um, which is near where Robin works. Right. And Agnes is also visiting. So all three of us are in uh, Agnes's Airbnb at the moment. Well, it's exciting conditional on your existing, but that's going to be the question <laughs> for us right now. This is the question <laughs> of the day. So I'm, I'm very interested in this whole concept of existence versus non-existence. Um, that I think there's uh, kind of weird biases. Um, the anthropic one is the most obvious one of the fact that you exist. Um, but I wonder if there's a way of talking about existence or remarking on um, whether existence has value outside of the fact that we are experiences of existence. Would it help to comment on preferences over existence, which isn't quite the same as value? That is to sure. notice that people have choices about their future existence, at least. So they can choose how long to live. And we might think they are composed of like many parts, like a person at a moment is one of their parts. And they are this com combination of all their person moments. And some people choose to have more person moments. And they make trade-offs based on in some of those person moments, they might think, well, that's a pretty bad one. I guess I wouldn't want that to happen. So like somebody about to suffer a very painful death might choose to happen, make the death happen earlier just to cut off that whole painful part. Right. But mm -hmm. somebody who expects a healthy life, they would regret losing, you know, those up dying earlier than they planned. And aren't, don't those count as preferences over existence? They seem to, um, just in the description that you gave right there. I think that, um, I, given that at every at every timestamp of existence, we can choose whether to continue existing roughly because, uh, Suicide is an option that's available to everybody on Earth. And um, that implies that you therefore are choosing to continue to exist. So this is quite a common thing that if you if you if you think existence is uh, probably net negative, then you might then you might say to that person, um, why uh, why not just why keep going? <laughs> or or the alternative. <laughs> why not stop? Yeah, why not stop, right? So um I it's I think it's easy to say that. There's kind of a weird thing, which is, um, it's almost like, uh, once you're on the boat, it's hard to get, it's harder to get off than it is to, uh, it's, it's not as, as abstract as just a binary decision to continue living or not. Um, at least, at least in my experience personally, it is. Well, isn't. But since we all expect eventually to stop, yeah. then people make choices about when to stop. Yeah. So stopping sooner or later, and it doesn't that suggest that if they try to stop later, that they want to continue. Can I respond here? So like, I, I just want to develop Will's thought, um, which is, it's just very well known that there are these biases, like status quo bias or endowment effect, or however you want to call it, where once you have something, you don't want to let it go. Yeah. And uh, I think that our attachment to life is like the mega <laughs> status quo well, bias. And so well, hold on. Um, and so I think that just really often, actually, people will cling to something, even something that is worse for them and that makes them miserable, right? Because they just can't imagine letting it go. And it could be a marriage. It could be a job. Um, it could be sort of like the idea of having, say, an academic job or whatever. And I think it could very well be existence. And so we can't go merely on preferences. And to your point, Robin, that we all know we're going to die eventually, I don't think that's so obvious. That is, it's not so obvious people have accepted that. I think we're in a massive amount of denial about the fact that we're going to die. And we don't really accept it. And we don't allow that thought to enter into our conscious existence. And when it does, we are just filled with blank, mute terror. And so uh, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't think we can use that to say, well, we know we're going to die eventually. We just want it to happen later rather than sooner. I think it's in fact we're in denial about it. And we cling in a not rational way to the thing we've always had. And none of that is an obvious indication that it's better. I think people throw around these bias arguments way too freely. 
<laughs> author of a blog called Overcoming Bias, uh, there are many you know, psychological review articles that suggest that this endowment effect goes both ways and that there isn't an average effect one way or the other. So in some cases, people may be overly attached. In other case, they're underly attached. I also don't think it's obvious that people are in terror, therefore suggest they don't really know if they don't want to die. The most obvious interpretation is they're in terror of dying, suggest they don't want to die. Isn't that just the most obvious, straightforward interpretation? Can I read you something <laughs> that from, uh, I've read you this before, Robin, but I'm really happy that I get to read it to you again. Um, <laughs> this is uh, from an essay by um, Schopenhauer uh, that's called On the uh, Doctrine of the Suffering of the World. And uh, so I'm just going to read two quotes first. If suffering is not the first and immediate object of our life, then our existence is the most inexpedient and inappropriate thing in the world. Okay, that's the first one. And the second quote is, whoever wants to test the assertion that pleasure in the world outweighs the pain, or at any rate that the two balance each other, should compare the feelings of an animal that is devouring another with those of that other. So Schopenhauer thinks it's just an obvious self-evident fact that life is on balance incredibly painful. Life for human beings, for animals, um, it's just filled with pain and suffering and, you know, occasional tiny amounts of pleasure. But the dominant experience of existence is one of pain and suffering. That's his view. That's yeah, I mean, I, going off of this, there is this, there is this, this problem. I know you say you're reluctant to uh, call it a bias, but I think it's this is kind of like a, a game theory situation where where you're in the game and by being in the game, as in you're existing, you do have this sense that um, uh, it's it's not a decision that you, that uh, uh, someone outside of the game is making; it's someone inside of the game, and that I think is subject to the biases, such the the, the ones that Agnes was talking about, the status quo bias, and so so on and so forth. Because it's not as if we're talking about a question of I'm God, do I create William or not? We're talking about, okay, William's been created. Does he continue existing or not? So I guess there's actually, t there's kind of an, uh, before the life is created, should it be made or not? That's kind of question one we have here. And then there's question two here, which relates to the, the Schopenhauer quote and this general kind of uh, utilitarianism arguments is should um, should you, I guess, should you end life prematurely or how should you deal with the fact that there is suffering in the world? What's the best quote, quote unquote solution? Right. And, you know, with respect to the, um, um, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. Robin, go ahead. <laughs> well, so the relative fraction of suffering and pleasure is just not directly relevant to the question we're talking about. The question is, do you want to keep going? Is it worth living? Right. Yeah. And you could want to keep going even if your life is full of pain. Uh, that's a completely coherent stance because it's the alternative isn't pleasure. In this case, it's not existing at all. And you could just want to keep going. And I still would say the vast majority of people seem to want to keep going. That is, in most situations, that's what they choose. It seems like the straightforward interpretation is that they would rather have more existence. Oh, I remember what I wanted to say. One way to test the idea of, like, suppose you were God, right, mm -hmm. would be instead of looking at whether people want to continue their lives, where they're likely to, I do think, are likely to be subject to this bias. It's similar to, do they continue romantic, go off and continue romantic relationships to make them miserable, right? They just can't imagine getting out of it. Um, the, and they break you, you them can, up too soon, too. You can measure it as um, um, do, how, many, how much are people choosing to create life, right? Yeah. Um, and, like, are people choosing to have kids or not? And so you might think, if people choose to have less and less kids, that's just a sign that people value life less than they used to say when they have more kids. That would be one way to measure. Not like that, that'd be better because they're, you're, they're, you're talking about the like existence that you don't, uh, that you're not already implicated in. So there's two questions that are closely related. One is, do you want to keep going? And the mm -hmm. second is, do you want to create more life? Exactly. That is, do you want to have fertility? Do you want yeah. to have uh, children, basically? Uh, they're related in the sense they're both choices to create more existence, but one choice is much closer to you in the sense that you're continuing you, say, right now, 
and you have a much better sense of what that life would be like. But you're also got the bias in the one case and the, I don't the other. Do, I, you, you haven't established that this bias exists. You just have claimed the bias. Exists. Okay, I'm but not I actually see the evidence for it. I, I, I think that we have to remember that we're, there's, a, there's, I don't know if there's a word for this, but it's like a biological bias, which is evolution's primed us to quote unquote keep, keep going. But that doesn't make um, it a bias. <laughs> It does if we're thinking about a philosophical plane where we're just determining whether existence is a good thing. We're trying to. We're trying to. But why? Why think of evolution's attitude as presumptively wrong? I mean, why not so think evolution thinks you should exist, and that's a good reason to think you should exist? Because I don't know. Because I personally don't go to evolution for guidance on what my morality is. Why not? <laughs> this is another argument. So this, this, I guess this is this is kind of the underlying. Um, this is the seed inside the apple. Maybe is is does evolution provide morals, and can we Guidance. use the can we use the fact that it's constantly driving for survival as proof that survival is a good thing, regardless of say pain and pleasure. Um, and I, I, I'm undecided. You know, I'm not a philosophy student. I, I would say evolution is a good guide for you to guess all aspects of your mind that you aren't directly able to inspect. That is, evolution designed this mind of yours. It's a big, complicated object, and you can't see all the parts of it, but you could use evolution to draw inferences about what's likely to be in the parts you can't see. And yes, evolution has likely designed your mind to make you want to survive and persist. Therefore, you probably want to survive and persist, exactly because evolution probably put that there. And you don't think that's a bias? No. Why is that any different to, say, status quo bias? Pause for a moment. I didn't accept there was a status quo bias, if you recall. Oh, I see. <laughs> sometimes there's a status quo. I mean, sometimes people are biased in that direction, sometimes in the other. The literature, I do not think, gives an overall bias. So can I give an example? Suppose there's a kind of animal. Let's say it's a koala. Let's mm -hmm. make it cute. And that animal is sort of, if left to its own devices in its natural environment, is going to go extinct which we could represent in Robin's terminology as evolution wants the animal to go extinct, right? It has competitors, whatever. Now, according to you, the moral thing to do then is to let it go extinct because we are following through on evolution, uh, evolution's intentions. That wasn't the structure of my argument. But it seems like that was, that is no. the parallel to your own case. Like evolution wants me to keep living, so I should. Evolution wants the koala to die. No, no, so, I mean, part of your question is what do I want? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what you want is in part indicated by all the choices you've ever made. Yep. Those are indications of what you want. Part of what you want is also indicated in part by the thoughts in your head that occur when you imagine making a choice one way or another. Is it terror or joy? Yep. But another thing that is a predictor of what you want is the fact, the process that produced you, which is evolution. So the koala, we would expect evolution to produce the koala to try to survive. That would be our prediction about koalas. We do not predict that if a species is going extinct, that evolution has encoded in that species the desire to go extinct. That, that's just not plausible evolutionary story. Right, but it's like encoded in the other species, the desire to take up the niche. That right, so if we were trying to predict the at koala competitors' minds, then that's what we would predict about those minds. But we but could to, also predict about the whole, like that whole part right, but, of the world. But the challenge here was to predict what one person wants, like you will, and I'd say evolution is a guidance to help us predict what does Will want in the cases where Will can't just look directly and know what he wants. It just seems to me that there are so many occasions where what we want is not paralleled with evolution. To, so to say that um, evolution is going to tell us what we want with regards to our own existence. Well, again, I, I gave you a bunch of different things, all of which are indicators. So you're going to try to combine all the weak indicators you can to make yeah. your best guess about what you want. But it's one of the indicators. It's certainly, you know, it's correlated positively. It's not correlated perfectly. Sure. Okay. So can I ask you, why do you, why do you, I, I think I can put it the answer, but why do you care about, why do you think that evolution does provide a good guide for what decisions to make? Um, the idea would be you, you want something. <laughs> that, that's the key concept we're trying to infer. That is, you're about to make a choice, and one of the choices somehow corresponds better to what you want. And you've made many choices in the past, so it's the same concept, basically, reapplied in a new context, like you made a choice before about what you wanted. Now, all the times you make choices, you make it in a noisy environment where you have, there's a lot that can go wrong, so you don't perfectly choose well, right? Mm-hmm. So one of our explanations for your choices is noise. 
we expect noise goes into your choices. But we're trying to disentangle what you really run from all the other noise. And so, again, um, you are a machine created by evolution, a complicated one. And if we can understand the design priorities that went into constructing you, that can give us a hint about the kind of dis decisions you were designed to make and therefore about the kind of things you would want. And that's one useful source of information about what you would want. In addition to, again, the previous choices you made, the choices of other people who are like you, the, the feelings you get in your head as you think about making the choice, right? Those are all clues about what you want. And you want to combine all the clues you can to make your best guess about what you want. I think I understand why you're not scared about the AIs, like the singularity, whatever, AI becoming conscious. Because if the AI were to reason in the way that you just reasoned, exactly. then it would just do what we want. But the reason well, people are scared... Just do it. Cause... It, it, it. The reason people are scared is they think, no, well, the AI is going to start thinking for itself. And that's what all of us are doing. We're thinking for ourselves. We're like, I don't care what I was designed to do. I now own myself, and I now am able to reorient myself towards... The good in my own. You, you, could, you could say those words, but you are in fact still executing the program that evolution built inside of you. I mean, if it, I'm going to do that no matter what, I don't have to worry <laughs> about what evolution wanted. It'll just work. Right. But you might say, want to produce choices that you won't regret later. And evolution can be a guide to what you won't regret because evolution produced your regret. Yeah. Sex produces many regrets. Yeah. And that's what evolution designed us to do. So it doesn't seem it's true that following evolution sloppy. doesn't lead to regret. <laughs> Here's a whole different way to think about the subject. So often in society, we think about all of us together trying to sort of have shared responsibilities. That is, um, if if we have this shared infrastructure of, say, a government and infra, you know electricity or whatever, then we should each do our part to to make it continue and support it. Right? That we we have some social responsibility to allow society to continue. Right? And that's a responsibility a bit above you know just what you want. Uh, you should help the society continue and exist. Now, you know, that it's not an overwhelming consideration, right? If you have enough consideration, say, to want to, say you want to, for some reason, you need to crash your car into a power station and that'll deprive us all for power or something, right? You know, we want you not to do that. You have a bit of a responsibility to avoid that, but not an overwhelming one, right? Well, think of then all the generations in sequence that go all the way through time, right? You know, you, the ball gets handed generation past generation. And if you drop the ball, all the generations after you, you know, lose. You're part of this collective effort where, you know, you shouldn't fail everybody else. Let the else. team down. Let the team down. Like, so I, there are these interesting pictures, like sometimes like somebody will be out drowning in the ocean and they'll make a human chain yeah. of people with somebody on the shore holding on to something and one by one, they're all holding on to each other till they stretch out to the person in the ocean and get grab their hand and can pull them in, right? And if, if you join this human chain, you have a bit of a responsibility not to let go of the people next to you. Not only might you be in trouble, but like the whole rest of the people out toward the ocean, they might get swept out. And I would say we, you have a bit of a responsibility as the result of all the generations that came before you, all of whom continue to exist. And pass the ball on, you should Well, you should have kids, but you can that. commit suicide after that. Okay. So then you've done your part. <laughs> but, I, but I am making that, that part of it is still uh, uh, I would say you have a, a bit of a responsibility there. Okay, so I have, I have doubts on this as well. Um, I just don't know that um, uh, a life that isn't going to exist were you not to have a child has any value, moral value to you today. Because no, no one is affected by it not existing except for the rest of society, which may have required its presence, that child's presence. I think um, you're, you're comparing two states of the world, <laughs> one state where uh, the creatures exist and another state where they don't. Uh, you're anchoring on the state where they don't and saying, uh, that other state's hypothetical, I can ignore it. Mm -hmm. I can anchor on the state where they exist and say, your other state is hypothetical. And say this is the default state, and with respect to this default state, you're killing them. So if if I say that society is going to continue and that these humans will exist, then I think it's it's more to act in ways which are going to positively influence 
um, their lives. So don't drive into the power station, um, you know, focus on things which might seem problematic to future existence, such as uh, AGI safety, for example, or, you know, nuclear, nuclear risk, um, maybe even something like climate change. Um, I understand focusing on those when you know that those lives are going to exist, but you could also take a different strategy, couldn't you? You could say, no one is to have any more children ever, and we're going to fade out and and fizzle away. And I wonder if um, uh, the the latter strategy of of fizzling away is more or less uh, positive in terms of moral value than the former of letting life continue. And uh, when we make that decision, we kind of got to forget what's happening right now because that can change in a matter of uh i don't know 150 years how how about think of it this way in terms of cosmology you know we're we're all alone say probably for the nearest million galaxies Mm -hmm. and if you really like the existence of dead stuff with no people with pain look at all of the galaxies there's just this one planet in a million galaxies that has life (laughs) Why not just allow that one experiment to continue there? Must everything be dead? But you don't think just allow is one dead. of them. <laughs> I, think that, I think. Them. No, I think per, per, you know, there's one per million galaxies. I would say. Okay. Yes, there's aliens out there, but they each are alone per million galaxies. And so, within the million galaxies of each alien species, almost all of it is dead and empty, and there's just this one tiny piece of life. And you're saying, shouldn't that be dead too? And I'm going. Come on, like, let there be some life somewhere. Like, if if there's a portfolio benefit here, maybe <laughs> death is good, maybe life is good. Let there be a little bit of life. I think that with respect to the... So I'm sort of with Will in saying that there's something weird about the idea of moral obligations to non-existent people. And, like, you said, well, Will is anchoring on the case in which they don't exist. Um, But I don't think that, and you want to anchor on the case in which they do exist, but in the case in which they do exist, you can't make them not exist, right, if we're in that. Um, So, like, it seems to me we're neither assuming that they... That's true in the other case, too. Right. We're neither assuming that they do or don't exist, right? That's what I mean by anchoring. We're we're, focusing on one case and comparing the other to it as the reference point. Right. But I, 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 I think insofar as we're trying to decide what to do, we actually have to view both of these as live possibilities. Agreed. And I think... um, you know, uh, um, um, if there is going to be um, a rule that says, well, you have to go this way rather than this way, I don't think it can be because you have a moral obligation to those non-existent people. Because I don't think you ha- you can have a moral obligation to not yet existing people, even if they're potentially existing. It, 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 like, I think you can have an obligation to them conditional on their existence. So supposing we know there will be people in a hundred years or in a thousand years, we have obligations to keep the environment in a certain way, right? Yep. But the obligation to the non-existent people who who would only exist conditionally on our decision to make them exist, it's just not obvious that we can have an obligation to them yep. to make them exist. We might, it might still be good to make them exist for other reasons than having an obligation to them. We might just have an obligation to make the world as good as possible. That might be the best world. And so we have an obligation to bring it about. But I don't, one thing I don't think we have is an obligation to them to bring them about. I, I don't think that makes any sense. So it, you, you, a utilitarian argument still works, right? Just not a deontic argument mm-hmm. that you, like, you can just think that world, and that's sort of what Robin was saying. Look, the world in which Earth has life in it is a better world than the world in which Earth doesn't. You should bring better things about, so you should make that come about. The question then is just whether that's true. But I don't think you have a duty to... It's not like the human chain case, where the people are already there and they're going to die. So I, I think that that's, that's a really... I could say I was always destined to let go of the chain. I'm letting go of the chain now. It was always the way it was going to be. They were always going to drown. Therefore, I have no responsibility. If it's true that you were always destined. I mean, you you would say that and be lying. But (laughs) suppose it's true. Suppose you couldn't control your arms, right? And a thing was going to strike you. Well, then, in fact, you're not responsible, right? Uh, So I'm saying if we suppose that their deaths actually have nothing to do with any of your choices, which is what you're doing when you're anchoring on the possibility that they exist, then it no longer makes sense to speak about what you're morally obligated to do or not. I am more of the position you'd be morally obligated to to make the good if you can. Well, right. So the the question is, 
uh, what is the structure of that obligation? Why? And there's two possible reasons. One is you have a duty to those people, which is what your holding hands metaphor was getting at. I don't think that works. So I think we got to dump that one. I, I disagree. Still, well, I like an argument. The <laughs> argument was that in your example, it's crucial to your You example. say I can't be obligated to a creature who doesn't exist yet. Uh, I disagree. I, I can't. You can't be obligated to bring about that creature's existence. Why not? Because their existence is conditional yes, on that so very decision. That's, so that's, why? That's a coherent obligation. You could say it's wrong, but it's a coherent well, obligation. Well, so what I'm saying is, you can't, you can't argue for the existence of such an obligation on the basis of an example where that example is you letting down people that are holding your hand that already exist. Any example is motivating. It's not going to be an exact parallel. Okay, but this is the feature that we think is relevant. So you're not going to persuade us by trading on an ambiguity exactly there. I would add to the example of history that uh, not only are you the end of a long chain of people who continued your line of your lineage, you're the end of a long chain, many of whom eagerly wanted that lineage to continue. continue. They, didn't, they weren't indifferent to this lineage continuing. So, so it's kind of like a historical debt. You're, pe- you're continuing they, to yeah, pay. Yeah, they, they created you in part. You owe them. Part of like, what they want from you is that you continue. I don't understand why you owe them. That is, they, yeah, you no didn't right. make a deal. There was no contract. We can owe things without a contract that you made. You can you can be endowed with contracts. As far suppose, as suppose that somebody comes to your house, right? Yeah. And they renovate your house and they make it look look really nice. They sneak yeah. in, they're not there, and they renovate it. And they're like, you owe me now. You owe me money for this renovation. But we're Would talking about them? your parents, right? Not a random person that comes to your house. What do you oh, owe your parents? Your parents are a random person that you never met before you come into existence. They're I think you can owe your parents. They are not just some stranger. Of course but, they are. But, but your parents <laughs> had had you for their sake, not for your sake. How do you know it's not for your sake? Because I think I think most of the times, well, because evolution would would say like you know, sex is enjoyable. Um, we've now created I, I the think, child. Of course, parents can do things for their children's sake. Part of which is to create the children. I think one of the things parents most do for their children's sake is to create the children. I mean, suppose your parents came to your house while you weren't there, right? And they renovated your whole house with very, very expensive materials. And your parents say, okay, we did this whole thing. And we're your parents. You owe us money. Do you think you owe them? I think your parents get a lot of deference when they say, look, kid, we're happy you exist. We're glad you're happy you exist. But that was there was a deal here. So do you, something we wanted out of do you. Do you have kids partly and- because... To satisfy your parents? Uh, perhaps. I wasn't very consciously thinking about that. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about can your parents have claims on you? Can they say, look, we did this nice thing for you. You should do this nice thing for right, us. But one sign of whether they can have such claims is do any of us respond to them? Do so, you have kids? For an, I certainly didn't have kids to satisfy my parents. And so it didn't sound like you did either. Long, long ago, there were these people called Hare Krishnas. It was a religious group. And they had this trick of staying in airports and handing people flowers. Mm-hmm. And part of the trick was, if somebody gives you something, you accept the gift. And then they ask for something. You feel obligated mm-hmm. to, to give them a return. So they were asking for donations in return for their flowers. Right. right? And this is a common marketing tra- trick right. to, to strategy, which is, I do think, reflecting a real, actual human norm. Somebody gives you a gift of value and then asks for something from you. You have a bit of an obligation to try to, try to help them out. But Not you- infinite, but... You, you can't refuse it. the gift because you can't at the point of birth say no, no thanks. No, nevertheless, the norm still applies. I mean, it doesn't seem to me like you thought it applied in my example of the people sneaking into your house, even when those people were your parents. So in many cases, so the norm doesn't apply. I would say if somebody sneaks into your house and actually does something add value, mm-hmm. you could be pissed they didn't ask for your permission, but you should honestly ask, did they add value? And how much, how much are you willing? And how much is that worth to you? And if they actually did something nice for you, then you should acknowledge it and maybe credit them in compensation even. Yes. <laughs> they did something nice for you. See, I'm talking about a crazier example. Um, you know, there's a philosopher who I can't, I, was it Shauna Schiffer? I think it might be her. Who thinks that you wrong your children when you bring them into existence yeah. because you didn't ask for their permission to exist. And there might be 
I think there are, in fact, lots of um, um, bounds on why you can't commit suicide. Like, it's being illegal. You might think it's immoral for a variety of reasons, right? You might think you're not allowed to commit suicide. And so you've, like, trapped your kids in existence, and that's an immoral thing to do. And it's, like, wrong to have children for that reason. Because you didn't get their permission. In our last podcast, you, you know, we discussed this common observation that Consent is actually not that central to our concept of many kinds of social processes. Mm -hmm. Consent is more how we manage our conflicts. Yeah. Consent is an important central construct to figuring out how to deal with the fact that we each see value differently and, and have and achieve different values in things, but that the thing itself, consent isn't that central to it. So I might invoke that observation here and say, look, you know, the fact that you owe your parents doesn't have that much to do with consent. Like parenting is the kind of process where they really just can't ask you permission. Sorry. <laughs> They're going to have to make a choice and we'll have to deal with that. I mean, it would be nice if you could ask permission. So actually, as a side comment, you know, I have this book called The Age of M, Work, Love and Life and Robots for the Earth, where emulations create other emulations. And for emulations, they can ask permission before they create a new emulation because they're making a copy. And so you can go to someone and say, can we make a copy of you? It will have this new life over here. Will that be okay? And you could say yes. And then the copy's made and then they have this life. So for okay. emulations, we can ask them before we create them. Would that be okay? So, uh, but that's just not feasible for humans today. So I totally agree. That would be a really lovely solution to a lot of problems. If you could ask your child before it's born, do you want to exist? Um, and the fact that it could be a thing with the ends is, is uh, a, a good thing. But I, I mean, I'm worried about something there, which is that the M isn't making a, the child M um, uh, in its unborn state might not be making a decision completely by itself. Like it might have the same to come back to what we were talking about earlier. It's like the same, uh, sorry to use the word biases or the same kind of in, mm -hmm. um, impacts, um, uh, the, the same kind of influences in its decision making, which might not mean it's making an accurate choice. So Let's just say briefly for a moment that evolution hasn't made us into philosophers. It has, but let's just say it hasn't briefly. Um, and let's say we were deciding um, uh, whether to whether to make a brand new planet with a brand new species or not. And um, let's also say, I, I think this is right, but I don't know. It Does evolution exist without life? Do you, I don't know if it does or doesn't. Um, it seems to me it probably does, but it's just kind of one of those like undiscovered laws, maybe, um, that needs life well, to be. We might say selection creates life, so selection can't create life unless there was a moment when there was selection without life. Unless there, yeah, exactly. There, so then, uh, interesting. Um, I guess what I'm saying is, is before I'm worried that if we're making decisions about whether existence was, is good or bad from the point of existence, as in we are, we are existing. If only we could be like the god that's deciding, should I make this, this planet, this universe, or not make it? And then we wouldn't be go going to these arguments like, oh, evolution has um, decided that um, like you, you, there's an imperative to continue existing. Because you choose, if you were god, you would choose evolution. So the fact that we can't choose that doesn't seem like a, a, a strong reason why we should con continue to follow it. It's something that we haven't chosen. It's something that we've been forced into. What other basis could you possibly have for figuring out what yeah. you want other than what you are? That is, either what you want is comes from inside of you or it comes from outside of you. If you're going to reject inside of you, what outside will you point to? Where in the universe will you look to to find out what you want? I would say most people think of what you want is found inside you, but inside you was created by evolution. All those intricate structures you might look at and reflect on inside you to figure out what you want. Those are all created by evolution. Yeah. So I, I, that's very convincing to me as in like, where else am I going to find the answer? Um, because it's not as if there's non-life forms, which are capable. I mean, I, I, I don't really know how I to mean, think I mean, the moon is this. dead. Well, yeah, where moon, on the moon will you find yeah, the, the answer to what you want? The moon in the, in the kind of DNA of the moon, there's not going to be the answers to this question. I, I agree with you. And like, if you, if you thought you'd made some kind of super maxi intelligent AI, which you could ask questions about the kind of source truth of the source code of the, the universe, even that you would still be, um, maybe subject to these same concerns about evolution. Um, because the it's AI would have come from some of all exactly. Exactly. Um, 
So, so where do you go for this answer? I, I mean, imagine human beings trying, trying to ask themselves this question before there was language. Okay. And they're like trying to figure out what they want. Obviously they are not very sophisticated in how they think. Uh, and, um, and you might've thought like, well, first thing, if you want to figure out like what's going to make you happy, what's going to make your life fulfilled and meaningful, like first thing you're going to have to do is find a way to like interact with the others of your kind in certain ways. Right. And as we learn to do that, right. Then we also learn to like connect with each other in ways that are deeper than our original pre-linguistic modes of connecting with each other. I mean, and, and, you know, evolution is mostly gets us, I mean, maybe up to that point, but probably not. To no, I would language. disagree. Well, this is, this is a question of cultural evolution, but, um, um, and, um, and like, I guess I think that it's not right to say that our understanding of who we are is something like, well, we'll be satisfied by what corresponds to our antecedent programming. Mm. I think that we can become different and we can like learn and discover things that of are of real meaning and value that we didn't grasp at the beginning. They're not just the kind of logical upshot of where we started. And um, I think that, uh, you know, so there's a philosopher named Bernard Williams, and he has this distinction between things that I desire conditional on my existence. Mm -hmm. This is where my, Rob reminded me when he started about like how you want to have this combination conditional on your existence. So things that I desire conditional on my existence, and then things that would give me reason to exist, right? And um, so like conditional on the fact that I'm going to keep existing, I want food so I don't feel the pain of hunger. I want like the room at a reasonable temperature so that I'm not like sweating, but those are not reasons to exist. They're just things I want given that I do exist. Right. And then he has a separate thing of like, what could actually make, give you like reason to exist or make your life worth living. And he calls those things ground projects, right? There are things where there's something important that you're trying to bring about with your life. And it could be parenting. It could be a change in the world. It could be a way that you're related to other people. There's like some source of meaning and value that means you have a reason for existing. And I think most people are looking for that in their lives. They're looking for the thing that would give their life like a reason for existing. And in some sense, up until that point, we're somewhat taking it on faith. And that's actually sort of how I would put it rather than saying it's status quo bias. We're sort of like, okay, I'm going to keep existing. I'm just going to assume this is going somewhere, <laughs> right? But we're actually looking and searching. So I don't think that it has to be the case that we have to look to our coding, right, to say, I'll find what I want by looking at what the person made me as. I think it's like, no, 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 there's a process of inquiry that I'm engaged in. And I'm engaged in it partly by talking to other people and by looking into what other people have valued over life and by tr trying out sources of value. And what I'm searching for in that process are these like ground projects that would give my life meaning. Williams himself thought that um, you could find those things and they could, they could, they could engage you, but like maybe for one or two or 300 years, he thought we weren't the sorts of creatures that could handle immortality. We wouldn't find enough ground projects. We just get bored of them. Uh, so he thought like, you know, uh, you could imagine life extension and having ground projects for a certain amount of time, but not for like maybe more than like 300 years. So I really want to challenge this picture you painted that evolution sort of created humans up until the moment they started to talk. <laughs> and then after that, evolution turned off. And ever then, it's, it's been some sort of philosophical conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I, really, I really love this distinction between reasons to exist and things that are morally good while you exist, in a sense. But again, uh, this does have the, I, I feel like this has the weakness that Robin's talking about, which is that all those things that we might describe as ground projects, uh, good things, uh, reasons to exist were also designed by evolution. I mean, more, even more so that this whole process of discussing things with people and thinking about things in your head, evolution set up that process and has been selecting for that process for a long time, not just biological, but cultural evolution. That is, you are the result of biological and cultural evolution honing that whole process of thinking and discussing things and selecting the versions of them that would survive and reproduce. So you should predict that the kind of thoughts you will have and the kind of discussions you will have will, in fact, be ones that promote reproduction, at least in the ancestral environments. That it's not, there, it, there's not just a random relationship or historical relationship. They are directly related in that way. But then they often don't promote reproduction. 
So but, like but the, fertility's going but, down. But evolution has this really hard task in this complicated world to, to produce the tendency to reproduce. You shouldn't expect it to do it in every case exactly right. That's way too much to expect of it. But the complicated mo world was made by evolution. Yes. So well, it was, it was influenced by. Goal. It wasn't entirely made, but it was greatly influenced by evolution. Sure. Um, sorry, I had a point, but again, I've forgotten it. Like actors. <laughs> So you, you ask, you know, what is the basis? All of these basis that you will use to argue for wanting to exist or what to do conditional on existence or all of these projects you might accept or not accept, all of the machinery that you will use to do all that arguing, discussing, that was all produced by this evolutionary process, which was blind to the consequences. So it's going to be a noisy thing and have a lot of randomness and, and have a lot of un, you know unintended consequences from its point of view. But nevertheless... That's the process that produced you. But okay. not only evolution, right? You were just saying there are other things like laws of physics and stuff. But those are constant and will never change, right? So evolution is also constant in that sense that it's just the basic structure is constant. Right? But if we want to predict why you would do one thing versus another thing that we can imagine, we need to be imagining counterfactual variations that are possible, right? So if we want to know what we would choose, we're trying to imagine choice A versus choice B. So we have to be thinking about distinctions between A and B. So things that are constant between A and B won't be very informative for predicting a choice between A and B or advising a choice between A and B. So if A and B both are consistent with physics, then you know that won't help with that choice. I, was just, I remember what I was going to say. Just a, it's just a, a maybe an interesting remark, which is imagine if actually evolution is ultimately a self-killing thing in that um, over time it evolves to create philosophies and then and then <laughs> ultimately whatever whatever instantiation of evolution will ultimately decide actually it's better for nothing to exist and so it kills itself so i mean a standard observation it's a bit trite but i guess there's some truth to it basically the story is most animals don't understand death yep. they don't know that death will happen to them they just know how they do various things and they even if they notice a death in front of them, they don't make the connection to themselves in the future, right? And so they are not terrified of death. Humans are these creatures who can think about death. And so the story was, well, there was this big problem. As soon as evolution created human minds that could think about death, like they got obsessed with death, and then that got in the way of those creatures like being productive, et cetera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you know, they could see the cosmos and see their insignificantly tiny fraction of it, right? So the story is, there was this long period of evolution where evolution had to deal with the fact that giving human minds these broad capacities would create all these dysfunctional scenarios where they would get obsessed and think about the wrong stuff. But we are the result of a long period of selection after that. And so we are constructed exactly to avoid those problems. Our minds are, are able to set aside the our fear of death or come to terms with your small part of the cosmos, right? That that's, I mean, we haven't perfectly maybe done that, but that's what you should expect your mind to be, the sort of mind that can think about these big things, but still get on with doing stuff. I want to go back to Will's. I feel you haven't fully faced up to Will's question, which was a really great question. Um, so... Um, suppose we make the following empirical discovery about it. We don't know everything about evolution, right? Um, we don't know, we don't know like our, our state of knowledge. I mean, you know, we're still working on it and there could be big transformations in our knowledge. And I, we're imagining a hypothetical scenario where we, where we learn that sort of the evolution is like programmed with a death drive, right? And it is designed for us all to go extinct. And this is the way life works throughout the galaxy is that it, it's supposed to like go for a little bit and then and then stop and it kind of it kind of shuts itself off maybe it shuts itself off by having people develop nuclear weapons or whatever but that's just part of the evolutionary programming it's designed mm -hmm. to go out in this way would if we were to discover this would you think okay well this should change everything we should no longer aim for fertility we should just maybe we should all kill ourselves because that's what evolution wants and it'll make us really happy because we now know this is our evolutionary programming so distinguish two very different hypotheses here, right? One is that evolution will create creatures who try to survive, but nevertheless, some net effect of the whole process will make it all end and die. A second scenario is that evolution would create creatures who want to die, right? That's a much harder to believe scenario. That is, evolution would select for creatures who want to die, and that's how evolution would die. Uh, the first scenario is more believable, that as evolution would create creatures who want to survive, and nevertheless, indirectly, as a net effect of everything, it would all die. Um, 
But under the theory that evolution will create people's creatures who want to survive, who try to survive and it will fail, then the prediction is you will also want to try to survive. And therefore, it doesn't predict that you should expect to find inside yourself a, a desire to die. But suppose um, we are in the second case. I don't think it's so crazy and implausible that there is inside of, let's eat human creatures, a certain kind of uh, impulse towards death. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, um, in effect, let's say um, it's, it's encoded in us, right, this desire to die. But the way it's going to work, the way we'll eventually kill each other, is that the way that we evolve is that that desire to die um, grows bigger over time as the proportion of our total desires, right? This is part of how the coding works. And so over time, it becomes more and more important to us. And maybe the first way you see that is lowered fertility, right? Those are the beginning of the new humans, the humans who want to die. Um, and so this is how we see the trend, right? And we see that what our future is, is going to be like, you know, these, these humans who more and more want to die. Would you say we should reason from that to, well, we don't want to have future, we don't want to have descendants and we don't, you know, we should commit suicide. That's just not that. coherent with what an evolutionary process is, that, that you're imagining some other process and you're giving it the name of evolution. But I, that I, this is just not an right. evolutionary process. So like, I, like I, 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 maybe let's, let's just agree with right. you that this is, this is not consistent with what right. we take but, ourselves so apart. Let's just to know about take a religious analog, right? God yeah. made my mind and God gave my desires and God created this world of life. And then God for whatever purposes, wanted us all to die. Yep. And God encoded in our minds the desire to die. Yeah. And that's slowly getting realized. And then we are all about going on the track to die because we are trying to make ourselves die because we have found that that's it. So that's I'm setting aside evolution, yeah, but that's yeah, but, it, you know, yeah, but that's, that's we can work with a hypothetical with yeah. a God there, right? Okay. And so now what you should predict is you want to die. <laughs> that, that that's the literal prediction of this theory. Deep inside you, the deepest, most real structures, the most persistent, the most you know reliable pattern structures are, in fact, patterns that say that you want to die. That is, that is your deepest desire. And do you think once you learn this, you should try to die? It, it would tell you that if you choose that, you, you won't regret it so much. It, it'll be consistent I mean, be with everything dead. else. You're, yes, but <laughs> nevertheless, it yes. will be completely consistent with your nature and your desires that you would make this choice. You know, that if you want to recommend someone to make a choice on the basis of do they want it, this is, that's the recommendation here. Okay. So we kind of earlier we were saying, you were saying that um, because it's evolution gives us a drive to survive, therefore it's a good thing to survive and we should continue to have well, Therefore it's what you want. Uh, okay, therefore it's what you want. Therefore it's what human values might determine. Is, is, is if a, you a reflected thing. on all the complicated design, you try to come together a picture of what you want. Sure. That is what you want. So then that must, uh, but just the principle, it must extend so that if evolution wanted us to die, that would or be... Or if God wanted you to die. If, if the process that die. made you if the process made, that made you us, to want yeah. to die, if we can predict that, then when then, we predict that you want to die. Then we would say that it's like, I, well, I mean, in the evolution frame of mind, you'd say, okay, this is a, like a moral decision to die. Um, and so the morality is separate. So maybe it's time to like make this distinction, but uh, I get the most leverage out of what you want. That is, if we just look at all the choices you've ever made and we say in each choice, you tried to choose what you want. Yeah. And then you're about to make another choice. And in this choice, the question might be what you want. We could, there's a different question we could ask. Is that the moral choice? And I, I would make a distinction between what you want and what the moral choice. I think most people do recognize that distinction mm -hmm. because they often face a conflict between what they want and what the moral choice is. And so I think a w better way to say it is that we all want to be moral in part. <laughs> we just also want other things. And so then sometimes there's a conflict between the part of our wants that is to be moral and the other parts of our wants. Are the parts that wants to be moral, is that also determined by evolution? Yes. So in this story, where in actual fact, God, although in the counterfactual, no, in the counterfactual, maybe God put it there, but in actuality, it's right, right. But like, um, in in you know, in this world where we determine that overall, it's God that put all these wants into you. He also put the moral wants into right. you, and uh, and the things that conflict against them. Right. So, like, how do you determine in the in the world that we're actually in? Like, you know, so, so evolution. Uh, put in us uh, d these some uh, some desires to continue to exist and to reproduce, but that leaves open for you the question of what we ought what ought we morally to do, mm -hmm. 
And so how do you determine that we morally ought to do what evolution wants us to do? I didn't determine that. But, but, <laughs> but I mean, you, you, you were giving an argument that it's like, you know, this is the, the helping hands argument, right? Right. Well, and, that, that was showing there was a moral component. That wasn't saying that that was the only thing. Only but, but I guess there's the other complications, such as like what you feel like in the moment or, you know, what society might be telling you. Um, those other aspects. So it's, it, there's, I guess what I've been saying is that evolution is a part of your decision. Um, but morals are a part of your decision. And yeah. evolution produced that part and many other parts. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not all parts. It seems kind of faulty to me to be making assessments about how to act in the system using um, the the laws which brought you about in the first place. Like there's some kind but, of faulty but what else paradox is there. It's the rejoinder, like, what el what other possible basis could there actually be? So I'd, I'd like to believe that there's something kind of like gravity or um, some other law, like the speed of light, etc., that is, that is like the um, uh, whether life should exist or not. Well, we can have those laws as, comp as the causes of these ones that evolution give you. So, so, for example, one standard account of morals is that they're ways to manage the peace in large social groups. That is, um, what, what we do is we agree on some morals and we watch for people violating the moral rules and then we get indignant if they violate them and that energizes us to punish them for the violations and that manages, you know, keeps the group cooperative in certain ways. That's a standard story for what morals are, where they came from, why they have the features they do. Under that theory, it will you'll have similar morals in a wide range of social creatures. It wouldn't just be humans happen to have one particular set of morals. You would expect to see similar morals in a very wide range of alien and other creatures if they function in that same way to keep the peace in a social group. So that would be a way in which they are like the speed of light, mm -hmm. right? But the causal chain is, is then, you know, the universe, you know, cooperation is useful in the universe evolution needed you to cooperate. So evolution gave you the morals that produce cooperation. And then that's why you feel the moral obligation to be cooperative in certain ways. So, I mean, I, you know, I was trying to sketch the alternative method of making decisions that didn't require you to just look into your own wiring and then say, oh, okay, this is what it makes me enjoy or something. Um, and like, I think that, you know, the word for um like coming to have a new conception um, um of how things are um that's based not on um like studying what would be a satisfying conception but studying the way things are is learning right and so you might think look, value is something that we're still learning. Mm -hmm. Like as a species, we're learning what's valuable. We don't have a complete understanding of it and we make mistakes. And so we've done things that are bad, objectively bad, wrong. Um, and we try to correct and we try to improve. And just like we're learning about physics or learning about math, and it's not just learning about our brains, it's learning about the structure of the world, the way the world really is. There's learning we have to do about value. And we do that learning by talking to one another, by building institutions, et cetera. And those, those values are not just like, um, you know, the things that evolution, the constraints that evolution programmed into us to get along. They're in fact, I mean, that may also be true about them. I don't want to deny that. Um, because of course, physics and math and whatever those the, those results are also in some sense our brain were programmed to have those thoughts sure right but that's just like to say that our programming is consistent with our coming to know the way things are um and we don't do math by trying to do evolution and figuring out which mathematical result did evolution program me to have and i don't think we should do morality that way either um uh, that is, I think that the way we do moral inquiry is by trying to figure out what the right answer is, which is the way we do mathematical inquiry too. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of inquiry is possible. So, uh, it's possible that different creatures will want different things. It's also possible that along some dimensions, they all want the same thing. Uh, for the kinds of things they would all want the same thing of, then it makes sense to inquire about that same thing together in a universal way, because everybody will learn the same thing, because it's all the same. Um, 
if different creatures have different things they want, then it's not enough to know something generic. You have to know about you. I think you can make the same point about believing. Like different creatures believe different things, and you have to know specifics about that creature to figure out what it's going to believe. Well, the, like, well no. I mean, the creatures—if the creatures are all trying to learn math or they're all trying to understand physics—then they're supposed to converge, irrespective of if one of them has right. green tentacles and the other one looks right. like us. So that's, that's exactly, in fact, in decision theory, the distinction between fact and values. <laughs> Facts are about things outside yourself, and values are about you. And we combine them together in expected utility to make choices. So yes, uh, we, we usually conceive of facts as things that are just true out in the world. Now, your belief about facts in standard story will depend not just about the world, it will depend on the information you have and your priors. And so we understand how individual beliefs could vary based on individual differences in information and priors. But of course, we also see them as converging with more information to the fact that they are about. Um, I wanted to make the observation that um, if somehow you could defy your evolutionary heritage, which no doubt you can in individual cases, and just make a choice about what you value, and so maybe you don't discover what you value, but just somehow choose mm -hmm. in a way that reaffirms and reinforces such that you become different than you were, mm -hmm. and say, you know, you, you say choose to like pistachio. <laughs> and, and evolution did, only gave you this potential to like pistachio, but over time, as you keep doing something that reaffirms your taste for pistachio, you become someone who likes pistachio more, right? Mm -hmm. And you could say that's a way in which you can defy evolution, right? Evolution just gave you a general, you know, potential of a wide range of things, but you made a choice in your life and you became someone who 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 had this value, right? So we could say literally that's a way in which evolution isn't the only determinant of the values you have at the end of this process. Even in that sort of situation, however, in a large world of creatures like you, evolution continues. And the next generation or generation after that is much better predicted by, say, evolution than your taste for pistachio, in the sense that evolution already encompasses the knowledge that different people can play this game of changing their values. And that's what evolution was taking into account when it varied things to try to, to get the outcome. And that's all part of the game and all anticipated. Okay, but how's that relevant to my choice? I mean, it's kind of like saying, well, look, evolution doesn't need me, right? So I can't, and then I'm kind of at liberty. And then I might as well just think about what is actually good <laughs> since it's going to do its thing. Within a, a modest degree of freedom. <laughs> that's the, but I mean, I only have this one life. That's my degree of freedom. But, you know, and like I can have faith that evolution is going to do its job um, with me playing some small part in that. And then I should just figure out what's good and not worry too much about evolution. But in fact, if you think about evolution, it might help you get there faster because it might tell help you. Help get where faster? Where what? evolution wants? I'm no, saying, no, I'm no, to, that to this pistachio it. thing, right? You might realize if you looked at evolution, oh, it's going to make me want to do pistachio. Kind of like a spin off of the pistachio idea. I was thinking about um, like kind of contradictions within what evolution wants. Um, and um, let's say we knew uh, kind of in advance that um, humans um, uh, were going to be killed by like a, a, a fleet of. Um, uh, giant squids, and uh, they were gonna they were gonna evolve to rise out of the ocean and kill us. Um, how would humans react? Well, humans would if we knew about this, we usually develop you know anti giant squid weaponry, and Ooh. and then kind of based based off this pistachio example, I was just like thinking actually, whatever humans choose to do, whatever they choose to do, is because evolution ultimately effectively selected for them to be able to do that or to do that in the first place. So it's kind of like a slightly inescapable thing, um, uh, like constantly right. afflicting but us. Up to a point, that is, so there are many games in game theory, as you know, where the optimal strategy is to flip a coin. Yep. That is, the equilibrium says flip a coin. Now, the equilibrium doesn't say whether the coin comes up head or tails, right? So in some sense, you are the captain of your ship, the author of your life. You flip the coin, and you decided if it was head or tail. Right. So in some sense, evolution could have constructed you with some randomness. I mean, no doubt it, it had to take into account there were just going to be randomness it couldn't control. And so its overall strategy for you includes the fact that it can't predict a bunch of details about what you will do. And then you, you know, that's sort of a story about free will in some sense. Yeah. <laughs> that free will, you know, what seems to you free will is the randomness that 
you know, the system that designed you couldn't anticipate that it just had to accept. Yeah, evolution definitely has this like deterministic flavor where um, whatever ha- ha- happens will be because, in a sense, evolution willed it. Like so, so even if you think mm-hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna do activities which were um, uh, defined, but which no, I'm saying like the ones which were ev- uh, defined by evolution, they were still defined under. Oh yeah, I said I meant defy. Oh, defy, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, right. defy, yeah. They will, they were still defy. Uh, you, right. They, they were still defined by evolution. Yeah, I mean. yeah. It's kind of a weird, uh, like it's not the question of like free will determinism. Right. It's kind of like a weird abstract version which still encapsulates it. So, so you can think of a of a boss with a bunch of employees, and the boss gives certain orders to the employees, knowing full well eighty percent of people will follow the orders, and twenty percent will be pissed off and do the opposite. <laughs> and that's exactly what the author, the boss expects, and he chose his orders with that fact in mind. So, like, suppose yeah. that you were trying to, you know, decide whether or not to have a kid, right? And you might think that, you know, people should have, I know you're pro, you know, pro natalist person, so you think people should have kids, right? But presumably you don't think that everyone in every situation should have kids, right? And so right. let's take the following situation. You know about your kid that for their entire life, from birth to death, they will be subject to a tyrannical master, and they will, it'll be like this boss. I mean, they basically will just have to do, they will never have a moment of free choice in their lives. They will just have to do whatever this boss tells them. And sometimes it will bring them very great suffering. Um, and sometimes they'll think they're defying the boss, but actually like the boss controls them so well that yeah. that's just what their boss wanted, right? You might think, should I create this child? And like in that understood in that way, uh, and it's like far from clear to me that the answer to that question is yes, but that's the situation you think we're all in. Because because the boss deserves somehow deserves yeah, exactly. this. Yeah, it seems it receives we like are a weird aspect to this weird boss, <laughs> the tyrannical it's master. Not our parents, because our parents didn't choose to create us, right? Evolution made our parents create us. It's evolution, <laughs> our evil demon of a god. That exactly, we think we're all enslaved to, and we have to do its will. <laughs> so I don't. Do you guys remember when we started? Oh, I don't. No. No. <laughs> so so we should, have, let's wrap up here. You, you have a final word. So Robert. I will again pull your <laughs> your mind back to the image, which is factually correct. That for the nearest million galaxies, yeah, it's all dead and empty. Yeah, completely dead and empty, except on this one planet where there is this a lot of slavery. Going one on. species, a lot of astronomical suffering. One species <laughs> which has a lot of suffering, but also a lot of joy and insight and and community um and the question is should this one planet this one species this one set of settings should this be also like the rest of the dead universe should we empty it out and kill it there so that everything can be uniformly dead or should there be at least one maybe a million planets that will be expanded (laughs) (laughs) where it's not like that now when the universe is half full of life and half full of dead then talk to me about maybe we should save some dead stuff and not fill it all with life. But at the moment, it seems to me, if you have at all any uncertainty here, give a bit more to the life because it's way unvalid. <laughs> okay, I feel like we can stop. Yeah. <laughs> Before it descends. Yeah. So I click a stop on the record, right? Here? <laughs>